Um, good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Ross Virginia. I'm a faculty member in the Environmental Studies program here at Dartmouth, and I also direct the Institute of Arctic Studies, which is part of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, so the, this presentation today is sponsored by Arctic Studies, and it's also part of our ongoing seminar series on dialogues in polar science and policy. And um, it's, it's a real pleasure when you have someone come back who is a distinguished scholar, but it's also a colleague and a friend and someone who spent a good amount of time at Dartmouth. And so we're very pleased and, and honored to have Betsy Baker with us today. Um, Betsy's an associate professor at the Vermont Law School. And I think most of you realize that the, you know, the once sleepy Arctic has now become a, a region of uh, intense international importance and focus and many different groups now trying to understand the rapid environmental, political, and social changes that are happening in the Arctic. If you pick up uh, any newspaper right now, and I just scanned a couple of headlines just very quickly before coming over, Arctic sea ice sits at record low for mid-February. That's this February. The last gold rush, coastal nations grab for ocean floor riches. Russia to boost military presence in the Arctic as Canada plots North Pole claim. A lot of drama and intrigue here. China granted access to Arctic club as resource race heats up. So I think it's, 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 it's really timely and a great opportunity for us to have Professor Baker here from the law school because this is what she does. She studies, she worries about, and she's actively engaged in the, in the legal issues and the scholarship that relate to understanding these claims to the Arctic Ocean and the Arctic Ocean floor. Um, Betsy uh, did her undergraduate work at uh, Northwestern in history, and then on to a, uh, her law degree at Michigan. And then she left the U.S. and went to Germany for quite a while, combined these two interests, um, looking um, uh, as, as a legal scholar and a historian working on um, biographies and other issues that relate to the history of law. And um, she spent a good time there um, at the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. Um, she, re she returned to the U.S. and spent time at Harvard. Um, there she was working with their international students and programs for them and also teaching her real passion uh, about the law of the sea. Uh, in 2007, uh, we were able to, Betsy came to the Upper Valley to the Vermont Law School. 2007 was the start of the International Polar Year, and I think it's sort of propitious that that's when you arrived here. Um, and I think uh, the Vermont Law School, uh, I think many of you in this audience know, uh, is, is an amazing place. It has the top ranked environmental law program in the country, very strong programs in comparative law, and just a great group of scholars and students that come there. And she's also associated there with um, their new institute on energy and environment. She's a research fellow in that unit. She teaches all kinds of topics at the Vermont Law School, um, property, comparative law, international environmental law, and as I mentioned, what you'll learn about today, the law of the sea. Um, Betsy, I think, is, is, well, she's very well known in the Arctic community, and I think in part because she walks the talk. Um, she's been engaged in, in legal issues and policy issues, and somehow she found a way to get on the U.S. icebreaker, not once but twice, to go out and actually work with scientists mapping the ocean floor. So she, she sees this not just as a detached academic problem or, or an abstract policy issue. She's been on the icebreaker. She's worked with the scientists. She's worked with the international teams of scientists who are grappling with these issues in, in time and space. And I'm, I'm sure she would, would say that her work has been improved by working with scientists, and scientists have learned from Betsy. Um, her research is very widely circulated in, in the policy and legal communities. Um, her, she's written a number of very important reports and documents for the Arctic Council, and I think she'll probably be mentioning them in this talk. But equally important, she's also uh, been involved in, in consulting with and providing input to the Inuit Circumpolar Council. This is the Indigenous Peoples Organization that represents Inuit aspirations and interests in the Arctic Ocean region. And so she's a friend, uh, a dear friend in that community as well. So she, she's working very diligently to, to help chart a sustainable path for the Arctic Ocean ecosystem and also to help the people that see this place as their homeland achieve their aspirations about access to resources. Um, um, so Betsy, uh, is, she's a teacher, she's an activist, she's a scholar, and, and she's really been engaged directly and deeply in these issues. Um, so today I think she's going to give us sort of a, a, 
tutorial and an update on where these important issues stand. Um, it's great to have you back to Dartmouth, Betsy. You're, it's wonderful to have you here. Always welcome. And so her presentation is, who does own the North Pole? And I'm not sure you'll be able to answer that, but we'll give you a shot. So please join me in a very warm welcome to Betsy Baker. Thank you. Thanks, Ross, for that very generous introduction. And it is good to be back at Dartmouth. And I have, I think, um, been able to do as much as I have in the Arctic in part because of my time here and the contacts and interactions um, both with Dartmouth members and the people that Dartmouth attracts to come and talk about the Arctic. So I, that is a, a lifelong gift that I have from Dartmouth. I uh, will start my talk today with the disclaimer that everything I say is in my personal capacity and in no way represents the views of the US government or the State Department. And that's because I was able to take much of the experience that Ross talked about. And I spent about a year at the um, Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs at the US Department of State working on putting together a document of advocacy to explain basically the underpinnings for US rights in the continental shelf. So that's going to be the focus of my comments today. And I was aided in um, raising even more interest in the Arctic by Prime Minister Harper last December, Canadian Prime Minister, who um, when he looked at his country's proposed submission to the body that decides these things, and I'll get into all of these details, said, but the North Pole's not on there. So I want you to go back and do a little more work and, and come up with a case that might show Canada's interest in the North Pole. So my opening question for us today isn't who does own the North Pole, it's why is this featureless flat spot on the bottom of the Arctic Ocean under sea ice of such great political significance? Why is the North Pole, why does it have this draw for explorers? What is it about the North Pole that generates this type of, of interest because it is fairly featureless. This is a picture of the Mir submersible, the Russian submersible in 2007, out as part of the Russian scientific undertaking and cruise to explore the science that underlies its claims to the continental shelf. And um, I did not put a picture of the flag that they planted and I will get to that I did not ask Ross to read that list of headlines, but it really does fit well with my outline, which is to talk about how science, diplomacy, and politics all fit into this discussion of who owns the North Pole. And um, the first thing is that there are rules. There is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. I'll be focusing primarily on Article 76. There is not an Arctic race, in my view, and I think if you've been coming to these speakers on a regular basis, that is probably a consistent message you're getting. Um, and then who decides? And I would put my vote in the end with the diplomats, but also informed by the science and politics. I'm gonna spend most of my time on the rules part, which in and of themselves are fairly dry, but when you, you look at the science, behind those rules and how the science applies those rules, then it gets exciting. So let's turn to those. Um, every talk I give, I use this slide, and maybe it's because the first map I saw when I got onto the, the Healy, the US icebreaker that was mapping the continental shelf, was the interna international bathymetric chart of the Arctic Ocean. And it's important for several reasons. Um, it does have the North Pole on it more or less in the middle of the Lomonosov Ridge. And that's the point we'll continue to focus on. But what very few people know about this map is that it is a direct product of the fact that states were following the rules of the Law of the Sea Convention, Article 76, as individually they were tasked by their foreign ministries to begin thinking about how are we going to support our assertion of rights over the continental shelf under the Law of the Sea Convention. And scientists being who they are in spirit said, why don't we all work from similar base points? Why don't we share the information we have about the bathymetry of the Arctic Ocean and come, come up with at least um, 
some idea of what it might look like. This is actually the second version, and there has since been a third. But with the exception of Russia, all of the Arctic states contributed generously to this, and also some non-Arctic states. And we have this general picture of what amounts to 25% of the world's continental shelf. So the Arctic Ocean is very shallow. It has a broad shelf. And as you can see, Russia is entitled to a good portion of the continental shelf because Russia is so big. Um, there is the color distinction that you may see there between the light blue, which is the shallower, the shelf itself, and the abyssal plain, the dark blue. And what you're doing under Article 76 is basically trying to find the point where the continental shelf comes down to meet the abyssal plain. And that point becomes an important measuring uh, stick for the whole formula set out under Article 76. So you, you will see that slide a few more times this afternoon. So why are we mapping? Because the Law of the Sea Convention gives to any state with a coastline continental shelf rights. And those are sovereign rights to explore and exploit the resources of the continental shelf. So to answer the question that was on the first slide, who owns the North Pole? Even if one state were found to have had the adequate science, they wouldn't own it, right? Sovereign rights are not ownership. It's not territorial possession. It's not like our ownership of our own territory. They are rights in the continental shelf resources, living and non-living. So mineral rights, but also mollusks and slow-moving critters on the ocean floor. So that's why the states are doing it. And this is a really brief sketch of how they're doing it. So the Law of the Sea Convention does many, many things besides talk about the continental shelf. I'm only going to talk about the continental shelf today. It sets out the rules for how you measure the extent of your continental shelf, and it sets up a commission with a creative name, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. It's a bunch of scientists. It's not lawyers. They only deal with science. They don't deal with diplomatic questions. They look at the science that states bring to them to support their claim that their shelf extends so far. They, it would be impossible to present a submission without the years of science that go into um, collecting and then analyzing the data and putting it into the form of an adequacy document. You have 10 years from becoming a party to the Law of the Sea Convention to submit the data. And um, that has actually proven not quite long enough for some states, certainly states that do not have this kind of technical capacity that we do in the United States or Canada. Any of the Arctic nations have great technical ability. Uh, so they set up an arrangement called preliminary information for developing states that were just not going to be able to meet that 10-year deadline. Um, and I'll return to that preliminary information in a bit. We have 70 submissions to date. The most recent was Canada in December of last year. But the commission has only been able to give its recommendations in 18 cases. So this is a very long time frame that we're talking about. Canada's submission will be looked at right away, but we are probably not likely to have a recommendation for five to six, maybe even more years. Uh, we have, through the body that governs the, the Law of the Sea Convention, been able to improve staffing for the commission. So they're picking up the pace a bit, but it will still be a long process. As I think everybody is aware, we're not yet party to the convention. And I can talk a bit about what implications that has for, for the data collection that we're doing. Every other Arctic Ocean coastal state is party to the law of the sea. This is a very basic sketch, but gets across the idea that um, there is a 200 nautical mile distinction when we talk about the continental shelf. Set aside anything you know about the water column and the exclusive economic zone. That's not what we're talking about. It happens also to be 200 nautical miles, but we are not talking about the water. We're talking only about the seabed and subfloor. So up to 200 nautical miles, every state with a coastline is automatically entitled to those sovereign rights to explore and exploit. They don't have to map. They don't have to prove anything. Even if your shelf is three miles or three feet wide, up to 200, you can exercise 
the rights of the continental shelf. It's only beyond 200 that you have to start doing the science and that you have to prepare all of that documentation to submit to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. So that's what states are engaged in. There are a couple of things I'd like you to take note of in this excerpt of what is two pages of Article 76. A lot of rules, but it basically says that the continental shelf <coughs> is based on natural prolongation from the land territory. Right? So natural prolongation is not a concept we really heard much about until the Truman Declaration after the war. Um, and so scientists are sort of scratching their head, not really knowing what was meant by natural prolongation. But that's what a lot of their work has turned out to be, is, is trying to figure out, does this continental shelf actually connect to the continent? And is it a natural prolongation out into the ocean? If you recall that map of the Lomonosov Ridge, that does become the question when we think about who owns the North Pole. So the seabed and subsoil that extends throughout the prolongation of the land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin. That's what we're, we're measuring. This is what I was comfortable working with. I know words on a page. I know two dimensions. I know flat. Um, so it was really a wonderful opportunity for me to get out and see the three dimension, colorful, tactile word of, world of, of ocean mapping. Um, and to see how the lawyers and the geologists viewed things a little bit differently. For, I'm assuming there are, I know there are a couple of my colleagues from, from the law school here, but, and one of my students just walked in. So lawyers um, had, didn't really think much about the continental shelf before the Law of the Sea Convention was uh, negotiated. Um, that's an oversimplified statement. But geologists, when they think of continental shelf, they just think of this, the, sh the shallow part that we saw in the map, if you will. It's then the slope down to the rise and into the abyssal plain. For various reasons in the negotiations of the law of the Sea Convention, they found they needed a new definition of the continental <laughs> shelf, which the scientists were quite flexible um, in working with and have become adept at switching between the two different definitions. But the convention takes this whole shelf slope and rise and calls that the continental shelf. So the extent of the continental shelf is never going to be just the shallow. It's going to be under the convention. It's the point you're looking for how far out you can take that point to where it meets the abyssal plane. And that becomes important a little bit later. For those of you who prefer a bird's eye view of the difference between the continental shelf and the extended continental shelf, you have that here. Again, really just by way of review, before we get into more of the science, is that up to 200 nautical miles, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to map. You don't have to submit any scientific information. You're automatically entitled because 200 doesn't need to be measured. Um, you just have to know where the baselines are. It's beyond. It's in this area that the scientists are interested in showing the geomorphologic and the geologic case for whether or not something is continental shelf here. So trying to show how far out the shelf extends. This whole dark blue area above the seafloor remains the high seas. Right? It doesn't, we have, this, once a state establishes continental shelf rights beyond 200, it still has to allow all of the high seas freedoms, which are fishing, the laying of submarine cables, certain structures. So, Everybody thinks that, well, the ocean will just be completely cut off, but no, there'll still be the high seas freedoms. And the white, are, this is one estimation, it's already rather old, back in 2007 from Ron McNabb of the Canada Geologic Survey as to what will be left that's beyond national jurisdiction. And it's two relatively small areas. Because I know there are a number of scientists in the room, this does become an issue when we think about another component of the Law of the Sea Convention, which regulates who may access for research purposes the continental shelf. So the coastal state, once it has those coastal shelf, or continental shelf rights, can actually put a few more restrictions on whether or not scientists can access the Russian or the Canadian or the US continental shelf for purposes of 
scientific research. And if you think about how large the Russian shelf is, and if you think about access being limited even for things like buoys, right, recording all sorts of data, if we don't have data for half of the Arctic Ocean, we're going to understand a lot less about climate change, among other things, right? So it, this is a very real issue. It's something that a new agreement now being negotiated under the auspices of the Arctic Council is attempting to address, and I think they will come to a successful resolution, but that is um, yet another aspect of the Law of the Sea Convention I can only touch on. I put this map here to remind us that it's not only in the Arctic Ocean that states are mapping. Again, as I said, any state with a coastline is out mapping to show the extent of its shelf. And I also put it up here to provide me with an opportunity to um, talk about what I think is one of the most underappreciated aspects of this continental shelf process, is that it is helping countries to know more about their shelf and their neighbor's shelf. And once they have that knowledge, they are able to resolve longstanding disagreements about maritime boundaries and the delimitation of the shelf. So in the US and Mexico, um, we finally signed a maritime boundary agreement, and it sets out already where the extent of our respective continental shelves is. We just have agreed to that in advance. Um, Mexico has already made its submission and already has recommendations from the commission on its, the extent of its continental shelf. And it followed the line that we agreed to in that convention. Parallel to, not directly driven by, but parallel to the fact that we now have an agreed boundary, we can do things like sign agreements on how we're going to develop resources that might straddle that boundary. And in the case of the Gulf of Mexico, it's only about potential joint development of hydrocarbon resources. I say only. This has led, among other things, to an amendment to the Mexican Constitution. There were riots in the streets about the change of now being able to have uh, foreign participation in some of oil and gas development, right? So the ramifications um, aren't just about the maritime boundary. The Barents Sea is another really good example of, we, for 40 years, Norway and Russia could not agree on where the boundary was in the Barents. And it wasn't a direct result of the fact that this, both the Russians and the Norwegians had been mapping that region and now know more about what the shelf is like. But because they had that knowledge, they were able to resolve that maritime boundary disagreement as well. And this map, again, is to remind us it's about the shelf everywhere in the world, uh, the light blue being areas that are likely to be claimed in some form of uh, continental shelf submission. And I highlight Somalia to return. You may recall I talked about you have 10 years, and the developing countries were not all able to reach that, uh, or meet that deadline. So Norway, which has, is one of the leaders in its in technology for mapping the continental shelf, um, and in training programs for doing so. They worked with Somalia, basically a failed state, and helped it put in this preliminary information. So Somalia has its placeholder in there and now has a longer amount of time to work on a, on a full submission. Um, you may, some of you may know um, of the University of the Arctic and Lars Kullerud and his childhood friend, Harald Brekka, two Norwegians, are behind indirectly the fact that Norway is involved in this type of activity. If you don't know the grid Arendel um, website, it's wonderful maps about all parts of the world, but they have an Arctic section as well, and there's also a section on continental shelf. It's a resource for states that don't have huge ministries and state departments and, and um, geologic surveys to help them plan for their mapping of the continental shelf. Okay, so to the case at hand, the United States 
you can see in these polygons the areas where we initially considered that we might have continental shelf. This began with a desktop study in 2000. Congress appropriated funds and uh, the State Department turned to Larry Mayer at the University of New Hampshire. He runs the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping there. And there's also a NOAA Joint Hydrographic Center. And that's who the State Department hired when they wanted the mapping done right. So they prepared a desktop study. At that point in time, I think the estimate was some, oops, $1.3 trillion worth of continental shelf resources. Some of these areas are now off the table. You can see through the yellow that um, in the Arctic is where we stand to gain the most continental shelf rights. And collectively, we'll probably be talking about roughly two times the size of the state of California in terms of the amount of territory covered by these continental shelf rights. Again, we don't own them. We have rights to do things there. So um, a lot of effort was spent on mapping in the Arctic Ocean. Of the eight cruises, beginning in 2003 and ending in 2012, four of them were jointly with the Canadian. What you see here are the various um, tracks of bathymetry starting back at the Barrow, there's the Barrow margin here, and along the Chukchi cap and then out into the Canada Basin. That's the size of Montana in terms of the area mapped um, with bathymetry. In the four joint cruises, um, seismic track lines are not shown here, but roughly 15,000 kilometers, and those we did in tandem with the Canadian icebreaker, the Louis S. Saint Laurent, which has the seismic gear. So Healy was often out there um, breaking ice for, for the Canadians as they were collecting the seismic data, and in fact, a USGS scientist was the lead scientist on the Canadian vessel and the scientists were back and forth between the vessels throughout the cruises. So there's a great deal of cooperation. I don't have a lot more detail, but just to give you some sense of um, the Odin, the Swedish icebreaker being used by several Arctic Ocean states to do some mapping, because it's a really heavy duty icebreaker and could get to places that some of the other vessels couldn't. Russia also collaborating in what amounts to a, a yearly meeting of all of the scientists from the Arctic Ocean coastal states who just talk about you know, what, we've, what we've learned this year as we've been out doing our continental shelf mapping. The driver is the government mandates from each of those coastal states to go out and map and show where our shelf is, but the results are much more than just knowing the extent of the continental shelf. This is a, another bird's eye view of the two vessels, the Canadian and the US working together here. I actually think it's the Canadians are up front unusually. Um, and this is the world that just totally blew my little lawyer's world apart, right? To, to step out of the library and all of the words on a page and to see working in these amazing environments and the collaboration in ways that lawyers don't always collaborate. So it was truly, um, a, a life-altering uh, point in time uh, for which I'm grateful. Okay, so this is just one example of what we were able to do because of the loss of sea ice. So now the barrel margin that I pointed out is back up there. This is, you're standing more or less toward the North Pole looking back at Alaska. There's Barrow. And this is an underwater feature, the Chukchi Plateau. And this is the sonar swath on the Healy, 200 beams wide. And uh, in 2007, they had thought that that critical point, the foot of the slope, I talked about trying to find that point where the, the rise comes down to meet the abyssal plain, originally had thought that it was there, both based on the bathymetry, but also on the underlying seismic data. But you can see even there, you don't have the flat plain you, underneath the sediment, you still have this uplapping, right? So it's not totally flat. I was not on board that year, but in 2007 was the ice minimum, which meant that they could go places they'd not been able to map before. And so they went that much farther out, and there they found that 
the flat plane underneath the sediment, right? This being the sediment and this being the bedrock, if you will. I know that's not the right term, but um, so while it was not good for the Arctic Ocean, it was a boon for the type of mapping that the United States and other countries were engaged in that summer. And for those of you who are not familiar with um, what good bathymetry can do, uh, this is an example in ice-free waters down in the Gulf of Alaska, and I've enlarged, or Larry, these are all Larry's slides, Larry Mayer um, from the CECOM. This is what we knew about the Gulf of Alaska before the continental shelf mapping effort. And this was a compilation of fishing vessels, ships of opportunity, research vessels, declassified Navy, combination, and that was our rough understanding of what the continental shelf in the Gulf of Alaska looked like. But after being able to commit the costly resources to mapping it in its entirety, that's what we know. And just think about not only what that tells us about the extent of the continental shelf, but uh, sedimentation, um, underwater, who knows what this is, an underwater canyon, is it a sediment river? What does that mean for habitat? What does that mean for um, expanding fisheries or, or as species head north, what will they find, right? Larry's motto, or the, the motto for the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping is map once, use many times. And so there is a great wealth of information out there already on CECOM's website, the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. You can, these are all images from there. You can access not just the cruise reports, but the raw data in many cases. And this is one way in which the United States is very different than the other countries participating in the Article 76 process, as I call it. We're not party to the convention. We may eventually become party to the convention. In either event, we will make as much of our data available to the public as we possibly can. The Article 76 process actually takes a different approach. All that's published by that commission is an executive summary. And it really doesn't, you don't have access to the data. It's very hard to know whether the coordinates that are published in, in these recommendations or even in the submissions, you can't really test them against much. So that's an approach that I think that sets the United States apart and, and one worth maintaining. This is just one example of the non-ECS stuff, the cool stuff that, that is found out there. These are pock marks at about 1,500 feet. I don't know how deep they are, but I don't have a scale up there, I'm sorry. Methane, some sort of gas um, on the Chukchi Plateau. I, I had a bunch of these slides, but in, in the interest of time did not include them all. But um, others showing ice scours along the top of the, the cap, um, all sorts of discoveries, if you will, including new seamounts. In talking to some of the Eigert students today, one of them raised the figure, is it really only 5 to 10 percent of the Arctic Ocean that's been mapped? And I had not even heard the 10 percent. I thought it was closer to 5 or 6. Right? We know very, very little. So if you think about those ship tracks that I showed you earlier, you'd be going along the Canada Basin, which is like a big bathtub filled with sediment, and you're out there for eight weeks. It's really pretty boring just sort of going straight with nothing to look at but sediment. And then all of a sudden, you'll see, oh, there's a seamount, right? So of course, everybody, that's excitement, and you go map the whole thing. And I'm sure there are hundreds of those out there. We, our tracks just don't happen to take us across them. So understanding more about the, the shape, um, here's a geo off the Marianas. We are mapping off the, the Marianas because we have territory out there. Gas hydrates, um, dredge samples, Hydrates in a number of places, but also in the bearing. This methane plume is fascinating, and you can go to Larry's or to CECOM's website and see it. This thing is, I think, 1,500 meters high. And Larry Mayer is also the his shop is is whom um, Stephen Chu turned to when he wanted the Deepwater Horizon mapped, when he wanted that plume mapped, and so Larry's shop did that as well. And you can obviously map things that aren't solid. Um, and this is the deepest part of the ocean. So there are, and we're learning a lot about things besides just the shape of the continental shelf, suffice it 
to say that. OK, so that's how the rules and the science interact. I just want to spend a couple of minutes debunking the myth of Arctic conflict, Arctic race. Um, Everybody says, there's a race to the Arctic. You know, we've got to get there first. When it comes to this process of showing the extent of your shelf, it's very slow, very dull, very dry, a lot of arcane rules. I told the Eigerts, but the joke works every time because it's true. There may be five or six people in the country who have the combination that I have of law and some familiarity with the science that could do the job that I was doing as a visiting scholar at the State Department, but I'm the only one who found it interesting, right? I mean, it's just, it's really, you've got to love reading geographic coordinates. It, it, and what you're doing is producing volumes of processed data and analysis of the data. This is, happens to be Australia's submission. That's one copy of it, right? This takes over a decade to do, you know, Australia obviously has a huge continental shelf. It's not just data, you have to tell the story well, you have to just think about producing the maps, all that goes into producing a really convincing map that tells the story well. You could put the same data in a really bad map and the commission will you know, turn it down, but you changed colors, changed angle. So, and the United States is not that far along, it's just beginning now to turn from data collection to thinking about what it's going to put into this document of advocacy and that's what I was participating in. And most of this is literally just page after page after page of geographic coordinates showing those foot of the slope points, right? And think of the data management questions that come up. All of our data is at the National Geophysical Data Center, and they've been doing a fantastic job in organizing this and trying to automate some of it, right? So it's not a race. It's a very slow, deliberate process. Everybody's following the same rules, and at times you find it fascinating, and sometimes you find it brain-numbingly dull, um, truth be told. So Russia was the first state to submit something to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. They did so back in 2001. This is its map. Everybody was up in arms except the people who could read Russian, which I can't. But the translation of some of the legend says, this is where we believe our shelf extends. It's it's in no way as to counter any other potential claims to the pole. Um, it does not prejudice any boundary agreements or disagreements. It was a very mildly um, diplomatically labeled map, but people looked at this and said, my God, they're claiming half the Arctic Ocean. But as I pointed out, they are entitled to a lot of that, right? The science is fairly clear, and it really is just the questions like, is the Lomonosov Ridge a natural prolongation of the Eurasian continent that will become interesting? And that's what that Commission of Scientists, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, can answer. So they submitted data. They didn't submit a whole lot. And the commission said, we really, they didn't say, no, you're wrong. They said, we need more information. Take the time. Come back to us. This is one of the many, as a lawyer, one of the many ambiguities in, in these rules set up under the Law of the Sea Convention. OK, so they met their deadline. How much time do they have? Like, forever? How many chances do they get? What and how do you amend it? Can we raise our hand and say, no, we think they're wrong? There, there are a lot of questions that weren't answered. Today is not the time to talk about those, but if that is of interest, I can address some of the legal questions raised by the fairly bare bones um, uh, set of rules connected to Article 76. So in any event, Russia went back and started mapping. Uh, I show this because the 2007 sea ice minimum has already proved important, as I showed you on our map of the Chukchi Plateau and the US being able to, to map farther out. Uh, it was also important in, of course, in the um, Arctic Science Summit week was here at Dartmouth. Um, but it's also the summer that that mere submersible that I started with planted this flag. And this is the only time I've ever used, I really try to avoid using this picture in presentations because it raises all of the types of drama that, that uh, Ross was citing from the press. This is Artur Chilingarov, um, a scientist in his own right. And talking to my science colleagues, they're saying, this is the coolest thing. They plant, you know, they, you know, what it took to get that flag <coughs> down about a mile and a half below the sea level, right, under ice. 
So as a scientific accomplishment, or a technical accomplishment more than science, it was quite um, compelling. But it raised all sorts of stink in the, in the political and geopolitical world. Uh, I think it was a Swedish diplomat who said, this is not the 14th century, right? We don't go around planting flags. And indeed, I don't have the language up for you, but the article um, 76 or Article 77 talks about your rights to the continental shelf do not depend on things like, a, they don't say flag planning, but it's basically you have to go through the scientific process. So that was in 2007. Everybody was worried that the race was on and that we were going to lose it and that Russia was going to take over the Arctic, none of which is true. Um, this is a map the economists tweaked from something that Durham University has put together. Here's the ridge seen in a slightly different light. Um, Canada was preparing to submit its information in December. And as I mentioned earlier, Harper was concerned at that late state that the North Pole wasn't as clearly indicated in the Canadian um, submission. But I put this up here for an even earlier example of, oh my gosh, the race is on and we're going to lose it all connected to the mapping. Look first at who said this. It's the um, July 2012 report in Reuters on the Danish mission to map the North Pole. The State Department takes no position on who might have a scientific claim, right? Denmark may well have the science to show it. Russia may well have. Canada may well have. And here, Klaus Holm, then the Arctic ambassador, said, I reject this notion of conflict, right? That this is where we work well. If there's any area where every party has an interest in cooperating, it's the Arctic. The challenge is huge and the area is vast. But this was, again, in the context of, look, we're just out there mapping. We're following the same rules as everybody else. So we hear this again and again. It's the media saying, oh, there's an explosion. There's a race. There's a conflict. And the diplomatic world coming back and calmly saying, no, there's not. This is, this is what we're about. So to contrast that picture of Chilingarov in 2007, this is Anton Vasilyev, Russia's senior Arctic official in 2013. And he was responding shortly after Canada's announcement that it was going to send ships back and map the North Pole, since it wasn't included in a way that um, was acceptable to all in the Canadian government. About that same time, Russia had made some announcements both about military infrastructure and just other infrastructure generally along the northern sea route, which had grown quite dilapidated after the fall of the Soviet Union. And Vasilyev made a point to say, and I don't know if you can see down here, there is no militarization of the Arctic, right? They were basically out there making that announcement about plans to beef up the infrastructure generally. Some of it is going to be military. Some of it's going to be Coast Guard for search and rescue. And again, always, the diplomats always coming back, of course, it's their job to say it's not what it appears. Um, but the press was all over that coincidental juxtaposition of the North Pole announcement from Prime Minister Harper and then the Russian announcement about plans to beep up some of its military bases. There's no way it was in response. right? And the media takes these things and makes a story out of them. So that's my little side bit on no race. So then finally, to answer the question, who owns the North Pole, you have to talk about who decides. I remind you here of the language we had up earlier about natural prolongation. Is the Lomonosov Ridge a natural prolongation, either from the Eurasian continent or from the North American continent? So does it extend somehow naturally from this mass or some for either Denmark or Canada? Does it extend naturally from this mass? And that's where the scientists' work really becomes absolutely critical to answering the question. So this is a quotation from Kate Moran, who some of you may know, oceanographer at the University of Rhode Island. This was an article in Nature magazine back in 2008. Um, it's clear that the bedrock is the same as the Eurasian continent. That's the first step. Um, it used to be connected to the Eurasian margin. but under the science and under the law of the sea, the question becomes, is it a natural prolongation still? 
right? And I, I won't get into the various scientific theories about how the Arctic Ocean formed, but proving that it's still a natural prolongation, still attached sufficiently to the Eurasian continent will be critical for the Russian narrative. And we will not see it, we'll just see an executive summary of it, but you can bet that they've spent a lot of time bolstering that scientific case. So they will take that to the commission fairly soon. Canada, as I've said, I'm sorry, this is kind of small. Denmark, Greenland, and Canada may also have a claim, as I showed, that it extends also from the North American continent. The scientific question is what the commission decides. Uh, and it's happened already that the commission has said more than one country has shown adequate science that that its continental shelf covers the same area as another country, right? So it could, in theory, say, yeah, all three of you have a great case. But it's not the commission's job to say who owns or who's entitled to the North Pole. That's left to the diplomatic and political worlds. So the CLS explicitly cannot decide, uh, it can't even look at the materials, if one state files its submission and another objects and said, no, there's a conflict. We disagree. So you can well imagine that the diplomats and the scientists in any part of the world where there is a potential disagreement works, work with each other to say, we don't want to present it to the commission as a conflict. We might disagree at a diplomatic level, but we want them to look at our information. Um, so it can't decide areas in dispute, and it can't divvy it up as between states. And I think that's probably the largest misconception, is it's going to be this commission that gets to decide, and it's not. Um, and as I've already said, it's not unusual, as I have on the slide, for the CLCS to find science that supports claims to the same area from different countries. We've already talked about who decides politics. You've seen or I hope I've conveyed how long it takes to do the kind of preparatory work before you actually file a submission with the commission. And um, respecting and having worked with my scientific and diplomatic colleagues on the Canadian side, I can only say when I saw that announcement in the press, it just took my breath away. But why should it, right? It's, it's the political process in the end that drives at least initial um, directions for where a nation is uh, asserting its sovereignty, if you will. So it seemed um, counter to everything I knew about the role that science and diplomacy play in this process. I think how this will play out in the end, Harper literally did order the scientists to go back and do some more mapping. So they we at least are told, will be out um, mapping the, the North Pole region. They did think back to what I said about Somalia. So what Canada ended up submitting, and I think there must have been a bit of a scramble in that last week, was full information on its Arctic, excuse me, on its Atlantic continental shelf extent. So there it was a full submission, all the science. And they basically used that placeholder mechanism. They submitted preliminary information on the Arctic Ocean. So they will go back and eventually submit full information on the Arctic Ocean. So who owns the North Pole? Nobody owns it. If anybody is finally acknowledged to have the exclusive claim to the North Pole, um, they won't own it. It will just be the sovereign rights. We are quite sure that Russia will include the North Pole in its science. We are pretty sure the Danish will do that, and Canada has said it will map. Whether that actually ends up in an eventual submission, partial submission, we don't know. Um, this is, again, really by way of summary. The Commission will look only at the science, will not decide as to the overlap, and it will be a peaceful diplomatic process that will decide it. A proposal that's been floated by a couple, and I'll end with this, by a couple of different sources is why not just draw a ring around it, right? Make it a monument to Arctic exploration. Make it a monument to Arctic science and leave that symbolic gesture as, a, as an, one of international cooperation rather than um, national sovereignty. So I leave you, uh, I guess, with that slide.
with that slide and a thanks and hopefully time for questions. Thank you. Yes. I'd be interested in hearing you speak some of your connection with the Inuit Council. And it's not from my own experience with, with Inuit people, there is the question, the idea of ownership, the idea of resource, and the idea of exploiting resources. So could you speak some to what your experience has been in that area? Certainly, yes. Um, my work for them has been as a uh, writing reports on the regulatory regime for offshore oil and gas in, in different Arctic states. And this was in preparation for the Arctic, what was the exact title? The Inuit Resource Development Summit back in 2011 from which emerged an Inuit circumpolar declaration on resource development in Inuit Nunaat, so in, in the Arctic region. Um, and that was also a summit to resolve differing approaches amongst the different Inuit ICC groups as to whether and how to develop, right? And they do reference some of the points you raised about a different sense of ownership or, or stewardship of, of the ice water land. Um, it's not necessarily a resolved question. I think people in, it's, it's, some have the view that it's still open question as to what rights um, Inuit in certain countries have to the continental shelf, right? Um, some say it's a closed question. There is some room, depending on the national legislation, to argue that in fact, even though fishing rights may have been um, resolved or land rights may have been resolved through either land claims in Canada or through the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, there's still an open question about use of certain areas of ice and water. I think the most interesting example that tries to acknowledge both approaches to how we use or own water is in the Nunavut um, land claims agreement. There's something called the land fast ice zone. Also, even that agreement says you, the, the Inuit of Nunavut have basically contracted away ownership rights. It still gives them use rights in certain zones where they do subsistence hunting on the ice. And that means they have a say in um, sort of plans for development for the area, have a say um, in addition to the wildlife management structures that are set up. And I have been in conversation with folks in um, the North Slope Borough about, hmm, what arguments might there be that there are more rights there than are currently being acknowledged. I think of the Northwestern Greenland mm -hmm. that is across from the island, the Canadian there, that the, the culture of the people there, their underground has been cut off because of international treaties. And this seems like an extension of the kind of colonization which has gone on with indigenous people all over the world. Which is why the structure of the Arctic Council is as important as it is, even though the permanent participants don't have a vote, they're at least they're participating in the conversation. And in those forums, these issues are also being raised. And a, a really good example of how tenuous that participation right is, um, so these two agreements that have been negotiated under the auspices of the Arctic Council aren't Arctic Council agreements. One's on search and rescue, and one is on um, pre or preparedness in response to marine pollution. And in negotiating the first one, because it was just the states, most of the states didn't have permanent participant uh, inclusion in their national delegations, right? And they raised holy hell, said we need to be involved in this, even though it's not an Arctic Council agreement, you're negotiating under those auspices. So most countries ended up by adding representatives from their respective indigenous populations to the national delegations. So it's it's something that we can't take for granted that that right will, will always be, be there. I'm curious about the role of the petroleum companies like Chevron and others uh, that I believe have started some exploration. And 
how do they navigate this system? Do they get authorization from each of the riparian countries, or how does that work? Any exploration that has been done to date is within 200 nautical miles. Oh, I see. And I, I didn't put this slide in, but it's also pretty clear that the, hydro, the bulk of the hydrocarbon resources that are commercially recoverable are not in this area beyond 200. And no company in its right mind is going to be investing the billions it takes if they don't know what the title is to it. The other question I had is, where does the council actually sit? Uh, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental yeah, Shelf. Where, where is it located? In New York, and, in the UN building. What's its membership like? I mean, does it have an international membership? Or? Yes, you have to be party to the convention, so the U.S. does not have a member on it. And there's a certain geographic distribution, but the primary consideration is, are you a good scientist? Are you a good oceanographer, um, marine geophysicist? Yeah. Welcome. Yes. It's related to the first of these two questions. So, has there been any uh, work done recently, to your knowledge, uh, that assesses the impact of the uh, fracking revolution, the changing market of shale for shale gas to natural gas, and the consequences of that for uh, hydrocarbon exploitation? Here? It has considerably slowed investment interest. In, and Shell just announced that it will not be operating in the U.S. Arctic this summer in part because of the chaotic season they had in, in 2012, in part because of a Ninth Circuit decision um, in validating part of the EIS, but in large part because it, it's, there's just, it's not worth it economically right now. Um, I, I can't cite the studies, but I have seen in the last couple months two studies specifically on that point. Um, yeah, that's certainly something that's affecting the time frame for if and when uh, we will be drilling in the Arctic. Yeah. Chris. Uh, I have a question about the science of ocean mapping. Do, are there some new technologies on the horizon that um, are going to make this easier, more efficient than what is currently the case? There are, and what's even more interesting, I think, is the fact that the technology we have now is very different than the technology we had when they wrote Article 76. Right, that was how many years ago? 1974, they started negotiating that thing. Um, and it's really more on the seismic front. I'm not the expert in it, but sort of chatting with my friends is that um, not just for mapping, but also for oil exploration, that they're, they're developing less and less destruction. Mean, we used to throw dynamite overboard, right? And, um, and even, <laughs> so, so it's really, um, I think the practical impact on the ecosystems is more from oil and gas exploration than it is from this type of activity. These are sort of, think of the industry as the semi-trucks of seismic, and this seismic is really more bicycle or tricycle. It's, it's not the, literally the big guns that, that industry uses. Yes? Um, you talked about the commission and the Get some right, and you, they're all available on the website if people want to go take a look. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone gotten a sense of No, it's a, it's a, it's a well-functioning body. Its task is scientific. Um, it may seem curious, but certainly uh, members of the commission also serve as consultants to countries who are putting together their submissions, right? And in a, in a legal world, we think, how can that be, right? But it's, it's sort of scientific expertise, and they want the best science coming before them, and people rotate off, right? So there was a Norwegian that was chairing it for a long time, and now that Norway is basically done and has his recommendations, he's not particularly interested in being on the commission anymore. He's now out consulting. And helping other states put together. So are there formal votes, or is it sort of consensus? Uh, there, it, it's it's consensus. I mean, there is voting and discussion, but it's it's a scientific discussion. And I don't mean to be pie in the sky. Of course, there are political considerations, and and they probably feel pressures from from some ministries, but they attempt to, to be as neutral as science can be, which is not necessarily always neutral. 
No, there's not. And a really interesting question under the law of the sea convention is right now, so all of this depends on a state's published baselines, right? And those currently move. Every few years, a state will republish its, in its legislation where its baselines lie. That affects not only the continental shelf ma mapping process, but even more dramatically and more um, urgently, it affects small islands that are being covered, right? So do they all of a sudden, if we move that baseline, do they no longer have those fishing grounds that they've had for years, right? So there is a lot of discussion in the international law world. I don't know where it's going in other disciplines about the need to change that rule to a fixed baseline um, which would be counter to, to practice, but it precisely to protect the rights. So even if a country has had to re relocate its entire population, it still would have fishing grounds and, and that exclusive economic zone um, to gain some of its um, income, right? And the other piece, somewhat related, that I didn't get into, anything beyond national jurisdiction under the Law of the Sea Convention on the shelf, so any of those seafloor resources are subject to, uh, they're, they're not governed by any of the coastal states, but by an international seabed authority. And states that operate within their own extended continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, after a certain number of years, pay a percentage of the profits into a, a common fund for states that don't have a coastline, landlocked states or those that don't have the the deep sea mining technologies. Um, so that's a wide ranging answer to your question. Uh, you said the US hasn't, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, <laughs> and, um, so I know it's US, but, but clearly the US is investing the kind of money in mapping. Right. So when might I'm not sure it will ever happen. Two years ago, I said it'll happen any day now. Um, it's really, due to uh, ideological opposition in the Senate. Um, Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma has led the charge against the UN, really. He sees the United Nations in the title to the convention and views that as a grounds not to engage in it. But the concerning thing to me is that the, um, there's, there's more opposition to it now than there was the first time it came out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about 10 years ago where it was unanimous, um, but it was a procedural maneuver that kept it from getting to the Senate floor. This time, Obama has not shown any time in his um, administration a lot of leadership on the law of the sea. It doesn't, it's not a high priority. He, you only have a few chits to get the treaties you really care about through, and he's focusing on that. The one hopeful thing is that Secretary Kerry does have the law of the sea as a priority, but it's, I, I am no longer predicting whether or if we become party. But even if we don't, we will have followed the same processes, and as I said, we'll make the information public. So anybody questioning our, our assertion of rights would be able to go to the data and run it themselves if they wanted to, right? But it still wouldn't be the same um, imprimatur of that commission and you know Exxon is not going to go drilling if we don't join. So the environmentalists are like, great, let's not join. But then that doesn't allow us to take advantage of the, the really groundbreaking environmental protection rules that are part of the Law of the Sea Convention, right? So you, you can't really cherry pick. Well, this is a I, I, there was a, a question back here first, I'm I sorry. Yeah. I push you on the, um, resource rush narrative. I mean, okay. it's, it's complicated, obviously, yes. that uh, uh, diplomats uh, have an interest in downplaying the idea of the resource rush. Right. Because they, you know, everyone's calm, right? And then the media, as you mentioned, has an interest in upplay, you know, mm -hmm. making this a fast thing. But, you know, the UN, even last year, I think it was UNAP or, you know, some, they're perpetuating this narrative I think it's to 
is it to bring in the climate urgency elements of it? Because it always seems like it's, it's you know, not it's perpetuating issue. which narrative? The, the narrative of resource rush. So it strikes me that they're saying uh, that the UN, uh, UNEP in particular, I think, that they're perpetuating this, and it's not just about the issues that you're talking about, that it's, it's um, shipping things, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's places in the law where we already actually have some clarity. You know, they're concerned with what uh, fish migrating north. Oh no, there's absolutely. Right? So this idea of the resource run. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to say, like, right. So there's, I guess there there are different um, phrases. One is it's a race for the Arctic. Right. And there, I really don't see it as a race. And and we're going to divvy up. Russia's going to get its piece of the pie, and we're not. And so it's that race and that dispute that I'm trying to diffuse. I don't. I completely agree that yes, there's tremendous interest in the Arctic. China is trying to get its hands on oil and gas any way it can, but it doesn't participate in this process. It can't come in and say, no, we get this piece in the Arctic Ocean, right? It doesn't have a coastline there. But it certainly is trying to wield its influence in other ways. And yes, and as, as Ostabo, Admiral Ostabo, who was until recently in charge of District 17 in Alaska, he's my hero. He, I, he said, folks, everybody's talking about oil and gas. We have so much vessel traffic coming through the bearing, and we have no rules as to where you can go. And it's one of the most productive, right? So let's focus on the real threats, right? That's the rush that we need to worry about more. Well, I think sometimes the, 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 the maybe there's a conflation around yeah. the, right? Yeah, so of course. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think part of it is also then what legal or political or historical analogy you use to say, you know, there have been these moments in our in the last few hundred years where where there's this unclear legal, um, you know, open question about who actually is controlling the resource and then other factors, you know, so you could pick and choose and support either narrative, it strikes me, in terms of, you know, when there are uh, uh, open resources or a changing environment or changing technology you can come up with a parade of terribles, or you can right. come up with, you know, a cooperation. You know, it sort of depends right. on what you want. Right, and I guess my interest is in showing that there are rules in place for this particular process. There are certainly areas where we don't have sufficient rules in place, right? We don't need an Antarctic Treaty, but there are some gaps in how we govern um, fisheries, for example. Um, we don't have a regional agreement, and there's we're now negotiating a high Arctic fisheries agreement involving non-Arctic states, right? So there are gaps that can be filled. You know, maybe we do need marine protected areas in certain parts of the Arctic because we don't have those. We don't have a uniform environmental monitoring system. Um, so maybe we adapt what OSPAR does and have Canada, Russia, and the U.S. also follow those protocols. So certainly, and the other. Um, I won't call it a myth, and there is militarization of the Arctic, but it's not arming the Arctic to fight each other. It's in part to protect um, against that rush of commercial activity and to have things in place that, um, well, of course, our Coast Guard is military, which is different than the other systems, but to have infrastructure there both for military and uh, humanitarian purposes, if you will. That's it. Yeah. Why, why, don't we, why don't we stop here? And if there are other questions, people can, can come down the front. Um, if you're interested in all these things, Bessie has a wonderful blog. It's a little outdated right but now, but I'm reviving it. Yeah. Um, but if you can track her involvement and you can find any of these key documents that she's been engaged with or are posted there. And I want to thank you for uh, a wonderful assessment introduction and introduction. <laughs> Clarifying a lot of stuff that's just really not out there. So thanks so much.